And um, I didn't pick it up. I was way too busy. And another man came along with a big heavy grip, and he stopped, and he said, I think you'll need this, ma'am, and he handed it to her. Now, how costly was that? And why didn't I do it, you know? It isn't so tough to be kind. It's very tough for Dick to be patient, but, you know, this, <laughs> this bishop told me I needed to learn patience. So did the big book. So did the book of James. That, that's a challenge. It's not an attainment. But, you know, this stuff is going to make life better. We have a loving God who gives us these rules. They're not so tough. It's just that, you know, we have some rebellious natures and we have a rebellious guy out there working us over too. His name is Satan. At least Ann Smith and Bob understood that. The Bible contains over 900 promises of God. That's why this little book is fun, the Runner's Bible, because it has some of them and it has them categorized. It, commands, it contains many commandments of love, culminating in Jesus' statement of the two great commandments. Jesus was a Jew. Surprise, surprise, surprise. You know where I love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and thy neighbor as thyself came from? The Old Testament. This isn't something Jesus invented. It's something God invented. It's, it was the rule. And he was just saying, forget all this other stuff and remember the basic rule. First, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And you'll find that expression in the big book. The love thy neighbor. Dr. Bob said, you'll learn the true meaning of love thy neighbor as thyself. What are some prophets? Well, God understands himself, folks. He wrote a lot in his word about who he was. And he didn't say, I am a bulldozer. I am a light bulb. I am the group. He said, I'm the creator. I'm Almighty God, I'm love, I'm light, I'm the God of mercy, the God of comfort, the God of consolation, the God of grace. I am Jehovah who protects and defends. There's a lot of information about the Almighty. So if you're going to believe in God and you're going to love Him, why not know about Him? I don't know much about a bulldozer, but I've learned quite a bit about God. And you can learn about Him in the big book, believe it or not. He's mentioned there 400 times. He understands himself, and so a basic under, way to understand God is to look and see what he says about himself in the Bible. The only condition for coming to God and receiving his benefits is believing. And if AAs want to seek God, the God who can and will deliver them, the God who could and would if he were sought, the Bible contains the facts on how to do that. The Bible shows the way to find or rediscover God through His Son, Jesus Christ, the early A.A.s believe. If A.A.s want to follow the path of the pioneers, the Bible explains how. It's our choice. Yes, you can be an unbeliever in A.A. today. Yes, you can be a Muslim, a Roman Catholic, a Jew, a Hindu, a Protestant, and so on. It's your choice. But if we want to know what the early AAs did, they wanted to find God, and they wanted to find Him now, and there was a path. If AAs want to know the nature of the power that early AAs had, the Bible explains it. He was a healing God, a forgiving God, a delivering God, a loving God, you know, what does it say in the traditions? A loving God, as he may express himself in our group conscience. Where do you suppose that came from? It didn't come from a bulldozer. If AAs want to know what the big book meant by such terms as thy will be done, love thy neighbor as thyself, faith without works is dead, creator, maker, father, spirit, fellowship, the Bible is the place to learn the details. When the big book speaks of learning and seeking and obeying the will of God, which it does, the Bible not only sets forth God's will, but it shows how it can be learned from the Bible. Study. And by direct revelation. Why do you suppose early AAs sat around listening and fidgeting? They were trying to learn the will of God. They were trying to receive revelation from God. That's why they look to the Bible for guidance. 
when the big book speaks of practicing the principles. The principles were set forth in the Bible. If you want to know how to pray as God would have you pray, the Bible contains specifics on how to pray. I was interested in this bishop. Would you believe that he prayed correctly? <laughs> That's pretty pretentious of me. But it was very interesting. He reads the same Bible that I do, and he's an Episcopalian of all things. <laughs> but it's so interesting, you know, because we have a common source. I might even find a Jew praying correctly. Now, all this is nonsense, of course, but what I'm saying is, why just invent a way of prayer? Oh, I just ask him for help in the morning and thank him at night. I need him all day long. I need him all day long. Yes, Bob? Yeah, pray without ceasing. All day. Yeah, there's, and that's in this runner's Bible, you know. Pray without ceasing. When I get into trouble, it's when I stop praying. When I get into trouble and I don't want to, to yield to God and believe that he protects and defends, that's when the trouble call comes. And instead of speculating as to what sin, that terrible word, self-will and God's will are, A's can look to the Bible. If you want to know about sin, look in the Bible. If you want to know about God, look in the Bible. If you want to know about self-will, look in the Bible. People don't know what they're saying when they say self-will. They have a sense of guilt and a sense of impropriety. But every time people were building idols, God said, don't do that. You're worshiping the wrong God. And lots of times that God was self. And that was an Oxford group idea. You know, the devil said to Eve in the garden, eat this stuff and you'll be like God. And she says, Adam, get over here. You know, we got the answer, and we've been in trouble ever since. If AAs want to know what Bill meant by the conversion experience that formed the foundation for AA recovery, the Bible explains what to do and what's received. If AAs want to escape guilt and shame and fear that abounds in us, and I sure had it. Boy, oh boy, I was a scumbag. My grand sponsor used to say he saw an ad in the newspaper uh, not an ad, an article in a newspaper in, <clears throat> in uh, um, Virginia or someplace. Man was sentenced to jail for being worthless. <laughs> That's how I felt, you know. Worthless dick. You come in and all of a sudden you're shorn of everything, including your worldly possessions. One guy in Marin used to say, I came in without encumbrances. <laughs> I had nothing. <laughs> nothing. Well, I didn't come in with nothing, but I sure am sponsoring a lot of guys that come in with nothing. They've got nothing. And so you feel guilty about that and ashamed about it. Why should you throw your head back and say, I'm one of God's kids? And if you start with the self-esteem that comes from that, you've got something. You really have. Bob says one of the things that I taught him in the beginning that helped him the most, and I suppose... The reason I taught it is because I had to get it firm in my head. There is therefore now no condemnation in them that are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. That was one of the first things Shoemaker would tell people to read. One of the first things that Ann would tell them to read. Throw your head back. There's no condemnation. You don't have to beat yourself up. It's been taken care of. And I don't want to get into the theology of that, but I can tell you one thing. There's a guy from Maui sitting back there that can throw his head back. And he, when I first met him, his head was down. So was mine. I was afraid to go into the grocery store. Oh, they might have seen my picture in the Chronicle. Well, so what? I'm a son of God. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm doing the best I can. And God cares about me and he loves me. Boy, that's a formula for success. You know, where did it come from? The Bible. So, uh, we'll take another brief um, span here, and I just want to say that, you know, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I'd like to hope that a lot of you won't be afraid of looking at the Bible any longer. Uh, it's not a verboten thing. One of the interesting things is I have kind of a, I have a Roman Catholic priest in Florida that's, uh, I don't know why in the world he supports me, but he's written 
endorsements for my books and stuff, and he's got a master's and a PhD and stuff. And uh, the whole thing is, it's about, he's sending me stuff on how, what the Roman Catholic Church's position is today. And he said, Dick, this particular um, papal bulletin is the Magna Carta for the church. The church is getting back to studying the Bible. The popes are saying, not just the priests will study the Bible and interpret it, but it's okay to look at the Word of God. The three major Bibles in this world as sources are the Codex Alexandrinus and the Codex Sinaiticus, which are almost complete Bibles in Greek in the British Museum, and guess where the third one is? It's called the Codex Vaticanus, and I don't have to tell you what the Vatican is. So, you know, the Bible is not a secret. It's just that for a long time it was kept a secret. And uh, there's no particular reason in AA to keep it a secret. That's where we got our ideas. So that's what we've been about, and uh, we'll take more, one more shot at this. And um, that's all I'm going to say about the Bible. I could have spent another half an hour, I guess, um, going through the specific verses. Um, and and uh, I would suggest to you that perhaps the most important thing is not the verses. I know one Episcopalian priest, Rose, uh, Dick, is obsessed with the idea that he has to, has to find a verse for everything that's said in the big book. Yeah, he is, because there is a verse <laughs> for everything that's said. I'm just one of those determined guys, you know. That, And what I found is there isn't a verse for everything that's said in the big book, but there's an Oxford group expression, and that intrigues me. You know, when people are busy saying what's wrong with Frank Bookman and the Oxford group and ignoring the fact that their big book contains that, we're missing something. How can you understand something? That's what I was saying last night at the beginning. You borrow a saw. And I don't know how it works. It just works. The only problem is it doesn't work. If it worked, there'd be 18 million alcoholics in Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, everybody's making fun of the Washingtonians. Washingtonians. Uh, there were, what, 500,000 of them back in 1850. And they got tangled up with politics. Well, that's a lot different from getting tangled up with God. And let's stop talking about what's wrong with the Washingtonians. They ended 150 years ago. Let's stop talking about what's wrong with the Oxford group. As a practical matter, they don't exist today. And the, the way they exist today is far different from the way they existed in the 1930s. Let's start talking about what did happen so that we can gain an understanding of those words and not invent words. One of the biggest problems in religion is private interpretation. Everybody's got a view of what the Bible says. Instead of reading the Bible and trying very hard to apply Timothy when it says study to show yourself approved, a workman that rightly divides the Word of God. That's a tall order. Our Bible fellowship is not about telling you to study the Bible or what's in the Bible. It's about reading the Bible and spending a lot of time looking at sources to find out what God has really said. It's a tall order. But we don't have to reinvent the wheel. If you want to find out, get some good understanding of 1 Corinthians 13, read Henry, Henry Drummond's The Greatest Thing in the World. If you want to get a good understanding of a lot of the concepts in James, read this little The Runner's Bible. If you want to get a good understanding of the Sermon on the Mount, read the Sermon on the Mount. It's not that tough. And then you can look at Emmett Fox and the others that talked about it. So let's take a break and we'll come back and meditate people. And if you think about it, how true that is. If you really want to stay sober and grow and so forth, uh, how many meetings can you sit in? Um, a fine gentleman visited me out in Maui, and he's got 35 years, and he goes to three meetings a day, and I feel sorry for him. But for him, that's okay. But I'm sure he would be the first to say, as he did when he told me how he worked with drunks, that most of AA goes on outside of the meetings. 
if you're going to take the steps, if you're going to talk to your sponsor, if you're going to communicate, if you're going to have fun in AA, and I might say, I do. I listened to a guy talk to all this learned group down in Pittsburgh, and he was a black guy, and I, I was probably was the only one in the room that was laughing at him because I was laughing with him. He just, he's only got, I don't know, 13 years. This guy is marvelous. And he just has a, a marvelous message. But that doesn't happen in meetings. You've got to go to conferences <laughs> to hear that kind of thing. And we went to campouts, and we went to dances, and we went to Yosemite Valley, and, and we went to uh, our program, as I think I said on Maui, is don't drink, uh, trust God, and go to the movies. We go to the movies together. Uh, you better. You know, if I were into sports, I'd say, <laughs> trust God, clean house, and play baseball. My sponsor used to do that. And I wasn't into that stuff. I probably couldn't have seen the ball. I was so sick. But, you know, some of them would go sailing. Some of them would go. But the, the importance of hanging out with drunks and preferably people who are winners uh, is not to be ignored. Well, in early AA, people didn't sit around reading the Bible all the time, nor did they go to meetings all the time, because there was only one meeting a week. Well, what did they do? Well, they did a lot of things, but one of the things they did in their meetings, in Dr. Bob's home, and in their own homes, was quiet time. What is quiet time? Boy, is that misunderstood. So the second major root of Alcoholics Anonymous is quiet time. And it's independent of the Bible. Quiet time, yes, they had it in the Oxford group, but they had it for centuries. It started in the Bible, as we'll see. But the point is, it, but long before there was an AA and long before there was an Oxford group, there was what was called the morning watch. And it was a time for communion with God. And no less an AA than William Griffith Wilson said this, I sort of always felt that something was lost from AA when we stopped emphasizing morning meditation. That's a pretty good quote. Lose touch with God and your direct communion, communion with him, and you've lost a big deal. So that raises the question, well, what is morning meditation? Now, there's a gal that I just love out in Maui. She comes to our Sunday night meetings, and she says, I'm taking lessons in meditation, and it's been hard for me to acquire that. And she's a real uh, big book thumper, and she's a wonderful sponsor and stuff, but she doesn't know what she's talking about. Now, it's okay with me if she takes lessons in meditation. In fact, down on the beach every morning, there's a bunch of people doing this, you know, holding their hands outstretched, and they're doing, I guess it's Tai Chi or something. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But if we think that's AA in terms of what they used to do, now, are we supposed to grow away from what they used to do when it produced a 93% success rate, or are we supposed to find out what they did? Well, I prefer to start by finding out what they did and then say, I get a lot out of my Tai Chi lessons, rather than thinking I'm doing meditation. Well, you start with the dictionary. What is meditation? It's focusing your mind upon, pondering, thinking about, and we'll find out what they were supposed to fo focus their mind on and what they thought about. Early AA meditation ideas and practices came directly from the Bible. They involved studying the Word of God. Shoemaker used to define what quiet time was. There was a little pamphlet here on how to listen to God. Sorry, it started with looking at the Bible. And there was a reason. We'll see what it is. Quiet time involved prayer to God. And there were all kinds of prayers. Prayers for healing. Prayers for guidance. Prayers for forgiveness. 
and it involved listening for messages from God. And I think this person picked up on my book and said, well, you've got to clear the receiver. No, you've got to have a receiver. Then you can clear it. Now, that all may sound like gibberish, but I hope I'll make it clear. So this process of studying the Bible, praying to God, and listening for messages from God early on was called the morning watch. Why? Well, the Bible said it happened in the morning, and Shoemaker used to say, if I don't do it in the morning, it has a way of slipping down through the day. And mine does. I get up and I watched Johnny Cochran for a while. Now I'm watching Monica Lewinsky. And, uh, you know, I get a long way from God awful early in the day. Then I go out of the bathroom. Then I go down to the kiosk. And then I walk on the beach and I swim. And if I'm fortunate, none of my sponsees are with me. And then I spend an hour with God on the walking tour. But I'm not reading the Word, and I should. And so it does have a way of slipping away. And the earlier you get cracking, the earlier you're starting out with God. And I sure don't quote, I, I write books about quiet time. <laughs> Dick's problem is, is that he doesn't observe it enough. And uh, that is called to my attention quite frequently by people that I know. So meditation usually involved reading the Bible, praying to God, listening for messages from God, using Bible devotionals like the Upper Room or the Runner's Bible or My Utmost for His Highest, writing down the thoughts that came. That was an Oxford Group idea, but it's not a bad idea, period. And checking the thoughts against the Bible and the teachings of Christ and sometimes with other believers. Did they do it? Of course they did it. Dr. Bob lays that out very clearly in his major address in Detroit in 1948, which is conference-approved literature. They don't have to be afraid of this stuff. AA publishes it. We just read everything but that. AA's consistently used meditation books. Were they books on Tai Chi? No, they weren't. They were called devotionals. And each devotional contained a different text, but most of them contained the same approach. They usually had a little verse at the top and a title for that. And the title might be, Love Thy Neighbor as Thyself, and then they'd quote the verse. And, or it might be, Faith Without Works is Dead, and they'd quote the verse. Or Thy Will Be Done, and they would quote the verse. And then there'd be a little discussion and then there would be verses further verses for further study. And then there would be a prayer for the day based upon the Bible verse and a thought for the day. And that was the typical meditation book. And in the back of my Akron Genesis, uh, you'll find excerpts and also in this still missing quiet time, a uh, still missing um, syllabus, uh, examples of it. Because we ought to know what those meditation books were. The other 100,000 that I'm going to use, uh, uh, Mary, you, you now got me away from the first uh, 500,000 because you produced a book for a dollar and a quarter. But the other one would be some guy said, why don't you get all of the upper room books for those four years and publish them? Now, Mary, if you come up with those, uh, then I'll be penniless. Uh, because they, it's very hard to get them, and a few people, there's a guy down in Texas that uh, drags around a bound volume of them to, uh, to a lot of the conferences there. And, uh, and there was an upper room for each quarter, and the first publication of the upper room, oddly enough, was when AA was founded. It had nothing to do with AA's founding, but it started then. Okay. What are the biblical roots of quiet time, and who cares? Well, if you're talking about quiet time and you're not talking about its biblical roots, then you're talking about Tai Chi and crystals and meditation classes and a whole bunch of other stuff. And it's okay to talk about it, folks. <laughs> no, but you're not going to go to hell if you talk about Tai Chi. But if you want to talk about where AA came from, that's what we're going to talk about here. Why would you look to God's Word in the course of a meditation period? Well, the Old Testament said, and this is 
quoted right in this upper room. I think I quoted it. Yeah, it's in here. Uh, Psalm 119, 105. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If you want some light in your life, look to the word. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. That's me. You know, you read the Word and it gives you understanding of God and His Word and His will and how to pray. And then Psalm 119, 14 to 15. I will meditate in thy precepts. It's another word for your <laughs> rules, God. And have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. So over and over, the Bible speaks of itself as the word of God, or which is a comp, um, an assembling together of the words of God. And then this doctrine, which is accepted by Roman Catholics and Protestants alike, and possibly, I, I don't know what the Jewish faith believes, but... All Scripture, 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Now, that's why they studied the Word. They wanted light. They wanted respect. They wanted enlightenment. And it was inspired by God. That's what they believed. Haven't you met AAs? I did early on. It says the big book is inspired. Well, we might get into that, but if the big book was inspired by God, what about the big, big book? It says it was inspired by God. Okay. Morning was the time. Why do we talk about in the morning in the big book? Psalm 5, 3 to 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord, considering my, consider my meditation. Hearken unto the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for unto thee will I pray. This isn't Jesus, this is the Old Testament. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee, and will look up. And then Psalm fifty nine sixteen. But I will sing of thy power, yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning. For thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. Psalm 88, 13. But unto thee have I cried, O Lord, and in the, in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. And prevent's an old English word for precede thee. And then there are a whole bunch of other verses that I list here. Morning was the time. God was saying, start the day out with me. Second. What was meditation in terms of what the Bible itself said? It meant focusing your thoughts and reflecting on the Word of God. Psalm 1, 2. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. What does that mean? You study it. I will meditate in thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. Psalm 119, 15 and 16. Psalm 119, 48. My hands also will lift up unto thy commandments, which I have loved, and I will meditate in thy statutes. Now, I could go on and on and on and on, but meditation started with meditating upon, focusing your thoughts upon, pondering about, studying the Bible. And I have some other thoughts. It meant getting it right, knowing. Three verses. John 5.39 Search the Scriptures, said Jesus, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He was saying, the Bible, the Old Testament, talks about me. And then he said to somebody that was screwing up in Matthew twenty-two nineteen, You do err not knowing the Scriptures nor the power of God. If you want to know <laughs> that you know that you know, and you want to know about the power of God, know the Scriptures, he said. And then he was talking <clears throat> to the Bereans, and he said... These, the believers from Berean, talking about the believers, 
were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. Therefore, many of them believed. And, you know, you'll hear some donkey at a meeting say something, and somebody that's a little bit wiser will say, I wonder if that's in the big book. That's one reason I kind of use the concordance. There are a lot of doctrinal AAs that will say, the big book settles it, and that's it. I like that kind of talk, because I'm not interested in what don some donkey has to say, unless it's from his own experience, and it might be helpful. But the program is in the big book. And so... If somebody says something, you either look at the big book or you search your mind for what you know of the big book to find out whether it's baloney or not. Same thing was true in the Bible. Paul would come uh, romping through town and say something, and the Bereans would say, that's very interesting, but I'm going to go back and check it against the Bible. And they did, and then they believed. Same thing in AA. And then the one that we covered before, study to show yourself approved. So the second principle, first principle, morning. Second principle, study. Third principle is moving into prayer, relax. Boy, oh boy, I can't get any place in my little world when I'm full of tumult and anxiety and concern. And the big book talks about that. And there are a lot of verses that were studied in which the Bible talks about that. Psalm 36, 7. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Psalm 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 119, 133. Order my steps in Thy word and let not any iniquity have dominion over me. Psalm 136. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. And then Psalm 62, 5 to 6. My soul wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. <clears throat> so the third concept was relax, get quiet, wait for Him. Next one was watch. Be thankful. Don't be anxious. And I started each one of these things by saying, the good book said these things. So this is what the good set book said about that. Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray. Colossians 4, 2. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving. We're talking about the morning now and some other things too. Ephesians 5, 20. Give thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then a, a revised version of Max, Matthew 6.33, which is live and let live, or um, one day at a time. Be, therefore, be not therefore anxious for the morrow, for the morrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. We've got plenty to deal with each day. Write the thoughts down that come. This was a big shoemaker Oxford group idea. I don't think these two verses support it, not in terms of your prayers and mine, but they did. And so that's why Oxford group people carried around notebooks in quiet time and wrote down every thought. And so this little guide that was lying around here said, write down the thoughts. Well, do you know why you're writing them down? If you don't, why write them down? So they had this authority, Jeremiah 32. Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. You know why it said that? Because they'd lost the word. And so God revealed these things, and he says, Write them down, you lost my Bible. Write them down. Now, what's that got to do with quiet time? Well, the Oxford group thought it had to do, and that's an example of private interpretation. Is it right or is it wrong? It's not my job to say, but I will just say that, you know, somebody says to you, write down the thoughts. Why? Well, because the big book says so. No, it doesn't. Uh, the Oxford group said so. Yeah, it did. What did it base that on? Jeremiah 32. 
Jeremiah 32 wasn't talking about that. It was talking about the Bible was lost, so God had to pass it along again. It says, write it down, write it down. Then it was lost again, and they had to write it down again. And there's some interesting stuff there. Another one, Habakkuk. You hardly even know that's a book of the Bible. 2-2. Two, two. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. Now why did it say that? Because the whole Bible was God revealing words to holy men who wrote them down. Moses wasn't around in the beginning of the world. He wasn't. In the beginning, it was God. That's what the Bible says. So, God wanted man to know how the doggone thing started. And he revealed it to Moses, and Moses wrote it down. In the beginning, God. Moses didn't sit down and say, let me see. I wonder how this world got started. In the beginning, God. That's good. I believe I'll write that down. No. God said, Moses, tell you what. I'm going to tell you how this show started. And it was the same thing with Jesus. It was the same thing with Paul. God revealed what he wanted written down. You either believe it or you don't, but that's what the Bible tells us. So, am I a proponent of writing down the thoughts that come? Well, if in A, <laughs> you better. <laughs> I probably won't remember them for a second. You know, they come and they go. But anyway, that's the origin of it. Write the thoughts down. And so early AAs did keep journals and write down the thoughts that came. And then they had to check it. And a lot of fun has been made of checking. Well, suppose you get a thought. Go out and murder that guy. Did that come from God? Well, you and I would say no. Why? Because the Ten Commandments say, Thou shalt not kill. So if you get a thought, you want to know whether it's from God or from, or from some other source. And Anne said there are three sources, the devil, your own mind, or God. And if you want to know which one, check the Scriptures. And if you can't find that there, the Roman Catholic Church might say check with the priest. They probably would say check with the priest first. But one way or the other, you check. You don't just accept it because it might not be from God. And then the Oxford group checked it against the four absolutes and they checked it with other believers. Check the word. Well, one way is to come back to the book of James 1.17. And Bill used to quote this. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights. That's in our big book the Father of Light part, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So here, here comes a load of trouble. He just got arrested for driving without a license. So you're going to go running into the AA meeting and say, God was trying to teach me a lesson. I just got arrested for driving without a license. I would love to grab the guy by the collar and say God didn't have a darn thing to do with that. The highway patrol is trying to protect us. You know, Every good and perfect gift is from above. And AAs were taught that. You've got a loving God. He doesn't go around arresting people. You're responsible for your actions. And the highway patrol is enforcing the law. But God isn't trying to teach you a lesson. The highway patrol is. Okay, a very profound point. Next is believe. You know, you get a message and you find that it's consistent with the Scripture and it says, love that man, don't hate him. And it comes through very strong. Dick, what are you hating this guy for? What are you treating him this way for? Don't do that. And the thought comes strong. And you've prayed about it. And you've seen in the Bible, be kind and agree with your adversary quickly. And you've written it down. You've checked it. And it's consistent with the Scripture. Believe it. Especially if it says you can be delivered from this situation. What did the good book say? Matthew 21, 22. And all things whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you shall receive. You're not going to get anything from God without believing, says the Bible. And then obey. 
The Oxford group was big on obey. Jeremiah 7.23 Obey my voice and I will be your God and you shall be my people and walk you in all the ways that I've commanded you that it may be well with you. Look at the back page of the last page of the big book, 164 text. See that your relationship with him is right and great things will come to pass. You know, when you're walking with God and for God, expect good results. Obey and do the things I command you and it'll be pretty good. And then from the book of James, 122, be ye doers of the word, not hearers only deceiving your own selves. It works. (laughs) The good book said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5.16 I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. I will, says God. Psalm 32.8 Psalm 37, 5. Commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. It works. It either does or it doesn't. I don't know how it works. It just works. No. It works if it's based upon God's will. Commit your way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Does the big book say that? Mine does. It says, trust God, clean house, work with others, and that's your answer. Now, is that biblical? Well, it certainly started with the Bible, and where it goes today, I'll leave to you. But, you know, these things do have their origins, and if we want to get straight on them, let's start with where they came from, and then you can come up with your own opinion. I certainly have lots of opinions. Okay. Now, what are the elements of quiet time? Brace yourself. One kind gentleman came up to me and he says, when I heard you last night, I was going to leave. And I I don't know what's happened today. I think he's had a spiritual awakening. (laughs) But the point is, some of this is tough stuff because it sounds like preaching. And it possibly is. But believe me, it's history. It's history. What you do with it is your choice. What are the elements of quiet time? Again, the little pamphlet, How to Listen to God. It misses the most important element. You've got to have a receiver. You can't get a message if it, on the telephone if you don't have a telephone. You can't get a message from TV or on the computer unless you have those things. What did early AAs believe and why did they talk about being born again and what did born again be, mean? One of my clients that I'll be staying with, former clients that I'll be staying with in Manhattan Beach on the way home, his mother came up to me a long time ago and she says, Dick, Charlie asked me, are you saved? She said, isn't that ridiculous? And I said, it sure is. Because I didn't have a clue what that meant. Saved is from the Greek word sozo, which means to be made whole, for man to get back what he didn't have, Norman Vincent Peale's son-in-law called me one day and he said, Dick, people have forgotten why they need a Savior. We need to be made whole. The Jews were God's chosen people. And when they walked his way, they got results. And when they didn't, they didn't get results. The Gentiles, (coughs) which was the rest of the world, didn't have anything. And they needed to be made whole. They needed to receive spirit. And the Bible story is how Jesus came and suffered and was killed and raised from the dead and ascended to heaven so that man could get a receiving set. What's that receiving set? Power. Now, is this all gobbledygook? Well, Shoemaker's first book in Realizing Religion said, Now St. Augustine truly said, We are not born Christians, but we become Christians. And then Shoemaker wrote, what you want is simply a vital religious experience. You need to find God. Does that sound familiar? You need Jesus Christ. That doesn't sound familiar, but that's what they believed. God on his part, said Shoemaker, has longed to win us for years. It has been we who have been unwilling. We must open ourselves to him and prepared to accept all that it will mean to be a child of God. 
Action is required. If you want a telephone, you got to buy it. Want a television set? Got to borrow it. You want a computer? Stay away from it. You'll get addicted. But you got to get one. <clears throat> there are many verses in the Bible on that. But Henrietta Cyberling used to teach this. How do I know? Well, because her kids told me that. And I saw it written down in her notes in her Bible. <clears throat> uh, this is long. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9 to 14. And I'm not going to ask you to absorb this, but I'll read it. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor neither have entered into the heart of man the things that which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of a man, which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God. Try this on a newcomer, by the way. He'll just fall asleep. That we might not know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom speaketh, teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the man who doesn't have spirit, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now that's a walloping big bit of theology, which was simplified in the old days, into surrender. Surrender. Let God come into your life. And you got a receiver. And then you can listen to God, and the message begins to make sense, because it's spiritual, not senses knowledge. Now, that's pretty tough. All I'm saying is I don't think anybody was sitting around teaching the AAs this. They were reading it. They probably didn't understand it. But when an authoritative guy like Dr. Bob said, get out on your knees and surrender, the guy says, I don't know how to pray. And he would say, I guess not. I'll pray. You follow. And, you know, like when Bill staggered into the rescue mission in New York, drunk, and they had an altar call, and he marches up to the altar, and he makes a decision for Christ and can't remember it. And yet, three days later, he got sober once and for all. Now, everybody thinks it's because of the white flash experience in Towns Hospital, and I'm not going to argue that, but I will say that some people think he was having hallucinations. I wouldn't know. Uh, I know what Bill thought, and I also know what he did, and one way or the other, he thought he'd been born again, that he had received spirit. So then, then only comes the clearing to the, bo the blocks to the receiver. What does that mean? Well, it means if we're angry, if we're afraid, if we're dishonest, if we're selfish, if we're built, built up with, with shame and guilt, we're not thinking about God. The messages that we're getting, whether they come from the devil or they just come from being just plain nuts when you're early on. It's like this guy said to me yesterday. I'm getting all kinds of messages in my mind. I said, of course you are. Brace yourself. You're sick. You know, the receiver has to be clear, and the early AA mind isn't very clear. I don't know about yours, but mine, boy, it was five years I was still wandering around. Uh, with you know one voice on this side and the other voice on the other side, and sometimes the voice was just hate that guy. He really did you in. Yeah, but the tenth step says, and the heck with the tenth step. Those my, some people used to say, I'd like to just take my head off and put it on the table beside me and let it rattle. You know, we're that sick. Some of us, we just have all these voices and thoughts and stuff rolling around there. And so AA had a device for doing that. One man was saying to me, do you do the steps later or do you do them at first? I think you do them at first, you just don't remember them. And then you keep, hopefully, passing it on and passing it on and passing it on. The newcomer doesn't know what you're talking about, but eventually you do. You know, it's a great process. You learn by teaching. Somebody said there are no teachers in AA. That's one of the problems. 
you know, you learn by passing it on. But the receiver is not clear, and the Oxford group had this formula. Get sin out of your life. What were they meaning? Well, the thoughts that block you from God. So, first, you were born again. You received a receiver, the Spirit. Then you cleared the receiver. And those of you who were here listening to Jim Hawk wouldn't have heard all of this. In fact, he was saying to somebody afterwards, i got to talk to Wally. <laughs> Because it's the receiver that we're talking about initially. Why did they surrender? Well, you've got to know that, or it's just gibberish. You read it in, the, in Dr. Bob and the Good Old Timers. Surrenders were important. Everybody surrendered. What does that mean? It means getting the power of God first. Then you can act. So then having gotten the power by the rebirth, and then having cleaned out the thoughts, steps three, four, five, six, and seven, uh, then you're ready to move on. And in the case of quiet time, you have to have a definite time, they thought. And so Ann Smith did. She dragged those poor drunks out at the wee hours of the morning, and they sat there, and they studied the Bible, and they prayed, and they listened, and they wrote down the thoughts, and they came away feeling better, believe it or not. And it was quiet and peaceful. Where? Well, one of the early uh, books said, shut the door on the world and all that would distract. If you want a quiet time, get quiet. You know, you may do it in your study. I do it on the beach. And I also look at some of those girls down there, and that kind of gets turbulent again. But, you know, wherever you find the quiet is where you get quiet. <clears throat> but it was, a, it was an enforced quiet. Some AAs didn't like the enforced quiet. But when they did it in their home, some of them did it in the bathroom. There were copies of the upper room in every bathroom in Akron in early AA. Somebody, that was their quiet place. Lock the door, sit on the throne, pull down the upper room and get quiet. People did that. And read the Bible. <clears throat> If somebody's talking about how to listen to God and they're not talking about reading the Bible, they're not talking about early AA. They're talking about their own ideas, but they're not talking about early AA. Why did we just go through all this stuff about, you know, study the Word, search the Scriptures, and so on? Because people believed it and they did it. And why? To get in tune with God's will. To get some understanding of God before they even prayed to Him. Bob was telling me there's a little thought when he was saying pray without ceasing. Some little kid said, if you bug God enough, he'll listen to you. <laughs> well, you know, if you bug him and say, listen to me, listen to me, you're not going to get the results. But if you keep bugging him and say, what do you have to say to me? What do you have to say to me? What do you have to say to me? You might get some results. And it isn't that he's not listening. It's that you need to get focused, I suppose. So, a definite early time, a quiet, peaceful, relaxed time, and reading the Bible first. First. And that's what they did in early AA. Early AA meetings opened with reading the Bible. Why? To get in tune. To get in tune. They had the receiver, and if they didn't, they were taken upstairs and <laughs> they got one. And I hope you're buying this receiver concept, not because you believe it, but just because it's a figure of speech for getting born again, saved, getting the Spirit of God, whatever you want to call it. Then, do we use devotionals? No. The devotionals were ancillary books. The Upper Room, the Runner's Bible, my utmost for his highest were not the Bible. They were used as assistants. And my goodness, my goodness, my goodness, when I started writing and somebody finally said, Dick, we need a meditation book, how many thousands of them are we going to have? There's only one Bible, thank goodness. And now they're putting the steps in the Bibles. The Bible doesn't need the steps. What we need to know is what early AAs did and how to read the Bible. Do you do as a devotional? Well, early AAs did. Why? Because they were sick. You know, it was easier to read one verse and one prayer than it was to have somebody say, read the book of Acts this morning. <laughs> you know, it was easier to turn flipper on. And so the, the, um, 
the meditation books were an assistance. They really were. Uh, they gave him one verse. And for an AA, it's a big deal if he can remember, Thy will be done. I could not remember the serenity prayer for a year and a half. I was a secretary of a huge meeting. And I had to type that sucker out and stick it down in front of me. And I'd say, we'll start the meeting with a moment of silence to do with you want, uh, as you wish, followed by the serenity prayer. And I'd look down and read that sucker because I couldn't remember it. So simplicity was important to the newcomer. It's not necessarily important to you. Growth is important to you and to me, I hope. That's why you're here, I hope. But, you know, the, the devotional books were not the be-all, end-all. And what's happened today, because we don't know anything about AA's spiritual roots in, in one sense, is that everybody's writing a meditation book. Everybody. Hazelton puts them out by the dozens. And then AA had to put out a meditation book written by a whole bunch of AAs. Man, I can't think of a worse source. Imagine, 365 alcoholic opinions. And that's where we get this stuff. God can be a tree. And if you don't believe me, read my books or come up before the weekend is over and I'll show it to you right in Daily Reflections. Why? Because 365 drunks don't impress me much with their opinion. You know? News, not views. And so they gathered 365 opinions and stuck them in a book and I got a sponsee that's reading it, and I can't get that sucker out of his hand. He thinks it's a simple way to God. Well, if we want to find a tree, that's a simple way. You know, we need simplicity, but not stupidity. And if anybody wants to quote me on anything, just keep saying, Dick said, don't keep it stupid simple, or rather, do keep it stupid simple. Don't keep it simple stupid. You know, the simplicity is because we're not too bright when we first come in. It doesn't mean we're supposed to stay super stupid for the rest of our life and read opinions of people who don't really know a heck of a lot about what they're saying. I think God does, and that's why people studied the Bible. And they studied the books by Harry Emerson Fosdick and Emmett Fox because those guys had studied the Bible a great deal and had some insight. But they were just aids, aids to understanding. Well, we sure belabored that topic, and we're getting close to the end here, believe it or not. What else was involved in quiet time? Praying to God, all kinds of prayers. Petitions, requests for guidance, forgiveness, praying for somebody else. Yes, praying for yourself. Shoemaker had some eloquent reasons why you pray for yourself. Do you think you don't pray for yourself? Of course you do. You wouldn't be sober if you didn't, I think. So you pray to God with all these various kinds of prayers. Thank you, God. Forgive me, God. Guide me, God. Take care of Mary. Whatever. And it is Mary. Okay. <laughs> Hearing from God. You know, that's a toughie. One guy has eight years and he came all the way out to California to talk to me. I think he thought I was the Messiah and there was a second coming. And he said, Dick, I'm doing quiet time and I'm not hearing anything. <laughs> and that was five years ago and I didn't know anything about what I'm telling you now. I should have said to him, you don't have a receiver, Bob. You can sit there all day long. You know, he was trying to listen to God without understanding how you do that. It's not just a mechanical thing. It's not just sitting. It's not just getting relaxed. It's not just going into the bathroom and pulling out the upper room. There's more to it. And then writing down the thoughts, checking the guidance, and then obeying the voice. What's the use of listening to God if you don't do something? Shoemaker wrote, a moral experiment is worth ten times an intellectual investigation in apprehending spiritual truth. Obedience is as much the organ of spiritual understanding as reason. What's all that mean? If you want to know, do. And he always quoted John 7.17. If you want to really know whether something is from God or whether results will occur, 
do God's will and you'll have a spiritual awakening. And I probably ought to quit with that. I'll see how much more there is. Oh my goodness, there's more and more. Uh, but I'll quit in a second or two. So, you know, the whole AA program in terms of its roots is premised on the idea that you will have, and at first it was called a conversion experience, and then it was called a spiritual experience, and then everybody thought they had to have Bill's hot flash, so they changed it to a spiritual awakening. But one way, or, and then he said our more religious members call it God consciousness, and what is all that about? It means if you do God's will, if you follow His rules, if you get born of His Spirit, they thought, and if you follow His rules by looking in His Word and trying to live those principles, what's going to happen in your life? A spiritual awakening. A real understanding that God has done for you what you couldn't do for yourself. Why? Because you've obeyed His will. And I really hope I'm getting this across to you. I may not be talking anything that you'll hear from New York and probably today very little of what you'll hear in Akron, but I hope I'm saying exactly what you would have heard in early AA because there are something like 350 books and pamphlets which are saying what I just said, and that's what they read. And if Bob, Dr. Bob ever did anything in terms of keeping it simple, he had the great capacity to bring all this material together and put it in AA's laps. And Bill had the ability to write it down. And it became the 12 steps. Um, have a nice lunch.